Hello, and welcome to the keynote portion of Folk Unlocked. My name is Angus Finnan, and I'm Executive Director of Folk Alliance International. We welcome your thoughts and comments in the chat section during today's interview. However, we'll not be able to field questions from the chat. We also encourage you to simply pause from engaging, sit back, listen, and enjoy. The following interview will be available for viewing after today's session also. Conducting today's interview is Anais Mitchell, the Tony Award-winning creator of the Broadway musical Hadestown. Dubbed one of the greatest songwriters of her generation by NPR, Anais comes from the world of narrative folk song, poetry, and balladry. She's a past recipient of our own Spirit of Folk Award, winner of the BBC Radio 2 Folk Award, and her latest musical collaboration, Bonnie Light Horseman, is nominated for this year's Best Folk Album Grammy. It now gives me great pleasure to also welcome our keynote interview, literary titan, Margaret Atwood. She's the author of more than 50 books of fiction, poetry, critical essays, and graphic novels, and has been published in more than 45 countries. Her latest novel, The Testaments, is a co-winner of the 2019 Booker Prize and the long-awaited sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, now an award-winning TV series. She's the recipient of numerous awards, including the Peace Prize of the German Book Trade, the Franz Kafka International Literary Prize, and the Los Angeles Times Innovators Award. During these strange times, hope and intention are more productive than sheer resilience. So given the dystopian nature of the pandemic and the social unrest and political chaos of the past year, we welcome Margaret's poignant perspective to help us refocus music as an ancient medicine for real and existential angst. We're absolutely thrilled to have both these esteemed artists with us. Enjoy. Hi, everyone. Hi, Margaret. Hi, Folk Alliance people. Uh, it's a total honor and pleasure to be doing this right now. Um, I think I speak for a lot of people when I just say thank you for um, your body of work and your um, what feels like very fearless and joyful um, presence as a committed artist. And I'm so psyched to be interviewing you. Welcome, Margaret Atwood. And thank you very much. And I'm very happy to meet you because I saw your wonderful, wonderful show called Hades Town, which was brilliant and really creepily prescient and uh, looking forward to what you're going to do next. Thank you so much. Thanks for going. Um, okay, so I have some uh, questions here. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited and I wrote a lot of questions and I'm not sure if we'll get to them all. We have a 25 minute segment here. But um, first one is that, uh, so I saw a video of you um, giving an introduction to Joni Mitchell um, when she was getting um, inducted into the Canadian Songwriter Hall of Fame. And um, you gave this beautiful little introduction. And at the beginning, you made a joke where you said, um, in, in French and English, you said, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to sing. Um, <laughs> but the fact that it was you that was asked to give that introduction and the fact mm. that you're here with all of us right now kind of indicates to me that you um, that music is, is important to you and, and maybe even folk music has a special place in your heart. So I wonder if you could just let us know sort of when and where and how you first encountered folk music and what it has meant to you. Okay, so a long, long time ago, um, I was quite a bit younger than I am now. My uh, parents are from Nova Scotia, which is one of the places where Scottish music went when it came to North America. And since that time, say late 40s uh, and 50s, it's developed really a lot of uh, singers have come out of there, you know, out of there, out of Newfoundland, out of Prince Edward Island. Uh, so that tradition was alive and well, and my parents were big uh, Scottish country dancers. Um, but also my dad in his youth played the fiddle, and then we're going back to the beginning of the 20th century here, and my uncle played the banjo. So that was that was always there, and we were always people who, who sang. Um, so that was my childhood. And then along comes the late 50s and early 60s folk revival. And 
in those days there were coffee houses which were typically abandoned um, um, warehouses and you got the Chianti bottles and the checkered tablecloths and the candles and the uh, folk music night and the jazz night and the poetry night and there was one in Toronto called the Bohemian Embassy and I used to read poetry at poetry nights but we would always have a, a musical interlude so I've got a picture of myself listening to then Sylvia Tricker, Fricker shortly afterwards Sylvia Tyson playing the auto harp <laughs> during the musical break at one of those poetry nights. And uh, Mariposa and things came out of that. So at the beginning, there were these um, folk nights in coffee houses. And then the folk festivals started happening. But um, Joni was just a little bit after that. She played at a place called the River Boat, uh, which I put in a short story quite recently. So there was a very active folk scene in the 60s in the city and in a lot of cities. And um, therefore, I was quite familiar with it. One of my good friends was a, a collector, you might say, of obscure folk songs. So uh, I've got all of child. And um, I understand you've just put out a new album called... <laughs> Yeah, What's the Bonnie called? Light Horseman record. Are you thinking? Yeah, of? yeah, yeah. Tell us that's... about that. <laughs> sure. Um, well, it's the second project I've done that is a sort of um, interpretive project in terms of like reworking, reimagining the old songs. Um, mm -hmm. And and the previous project I did is actually called Child Ballads, and it was with a, my friend Jefferson Hamer, and it was um, it was all specifically um, ballads from the child books. Um, this actually leads really well into my next question, which is, um, and that was beautiful, by the way, I could totally picture that cafe and it made me really nostalgic with the Chianti bottles and the checkered tablecloths and the um, real people in a real room. Um, so, yeah, it was, you know, obviously that, that phrase folk music, it means a lot of different things. Um, you talked about the coffee houses, there's like the coffee house singer songwriter that is almost like a poet at the lectern but it but they have a guitar and it's about the words and it's about the weaving of the story and there's also the fiddles there's um uh and all over the world you know there's so many different kinds of folk music and i think um like one of the common denominators is that it's an art form that um celebrates and kind of like wears on its sleeve the fact that you can trace it backwards that um however innovative, you know, whatever we might be up to as artists might be, that we're still kind of standing on the shoulders of the ancestors and we're still like invoking the same stories, the same imagery, the same music sometimes, and that it speaks across the generations and across the centuries. And um, and so it's connected like, to, to, to folklore and fairy tale and myths and legends and the old stories. And... Um, I'm curious for you as a writer, what's your relationship to the old stories, the old stuff? Um, oh, do you great. go there for inspiration and what has been most generative? What mythology attracts you most? Okay, so um, the toolkit, if you like, of of novels and literature and everything that you say before you today, there's, there's, a, there's a toolkit that goes way back and it includes a number of different traditions Greek and Roman, obviously, which is what you based Hades Town on, the myth of Orpheus, who was a singer-songwriter <laughs> himself. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And uh, uh, so Greek and Roman, um, European folklore, and that would be uh, Grimm's fairy tales, um, uh, Der Cannabis Wunderhorn, and uh, you know all of those um, tales that got passed around and a lot of them got passed around much further than you think so stories about uh, women who, who transform into animal forms are extremely widespread my favorite is a chinese one in which she transforms into a snail uh, but you know you've got swans and swan lake uh, you've got geese and hyda mythology uh, and this stuff is 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 transglobal people who transform into animals and back again. Sometimes they are um, threatening and sometimes they're mystifying, uh, but it's very widespread. So in Scotland, it would be 
see old people, uh, so silky stories. Um, so all of that, and um, and add to that now a, the body of North American indigenous stories that are coming in. People are uh, basing um, novels on them. Eden Robinson has got a trickster trilogy. Uh, Coyote has entered the lexicon. Uh, so things that people tell stories about and have and have for years, many years. So there's there's that that's about plot and characters, and uh, then there are um, the verse and song forms that have gotten passed down and built upon. So one component that we didn't talk about, which you are part of, um, are the protest songs of the '30s. So the Woody Guthrie and Associates, uh, those kinds of songs, and there is a big. English body of, of songs like that as well. And those two go back quite far. Um, so, um, so all of that uh, is being drawn upon now by younger people who have become aware of it. And these things have gone in waves, you know, they come in and then that's, then that's something your parents did. So it goes out, you do something else. And then it was something your grandparents did, and it comes back in again. <laughs> so in and out of fashion, but it's still always there. Incredible. I just, I, I, this, maybe this is not professional, but I'm taking notes because I feel like I'm, I'm getting my, I have like a personal master class going on right now. <laughs> well, um, no, not really. Yeah, so <laughs> I also, I incorporate those forms into, into novels. So um, we haven't mentioned hymns. But that's another kind of folk music, mm -hmm. and uh, that gets built upon. So people take um, earlier hymn tunes, they write new words to them, uh, and in the second novel in the A Mad Adam trilogy, I've got a, an ecological religious group um, that sings ecological hymns. But but all of those forms are based on real hymn tunes. So you can sing them to the tune that they're based on, if you wished. And in the uh, book about um, Penelope and Odysseus called the Penelope, the, 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 the maids that got hanged who are now in uh, the underworld, a place you understand, uh, <laughs> are, um, are using poetic forms in order to be the chorus. And when we put it on as a uh, uh, when we put it on as a dramatic performance, some of those were sung, some were chanted, others were sung. Amazing! Wow, I have that book sitting in my entryway. <laughs> I just got it. I'm going to read it after this interview. And I didn't know that there was a live component to that. That's incredible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So put up, put up Penelope at the play. You'll find it. Amazing. Uh, it was pretty effective. It was interesting. And when we launched when we launched the book in England, we did. Um, about the first third of it as a dramatic musical performance. Wow, I'd love to see that. Incredible. Do you think that this, the way that these um, these stories crop up in different parts of the world is about the actual traveling of those stories and the communication of and sort of translation of those stories from one culture to another? Or do you think that they spontaneously, you know, uh, exist in different cultures because they're like tapped into some kind of collective unconscious thing? Well, that is a question for experts mm. of which I'm not a one, but I'm, and, and they always um, disagree with one another. So, so the answer is we don't know, but I'll tell you one of my favorites um, in that respect. So, so there is a man who is trying to trace the queen of Sheba uh, to find out where the real Sheba was and uh, whether there could have been a queen from it who turns up in the story of Solomon. And the answer is yes, he did um, think that he identified that place. But meanwhile, he's out in, the, out in the desert sitting around with some nomadic people and they're telling stories around the campfire. And they start telling this story, which sounds to him an awful lot like Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> And it, and, and it is Romeo and Juliet, but there's this character in it who is a sheikh, a prince, uh, and his name is Sheikh Spahir. 
<laughs> so Shakespeare has become a character in one of his own stories. Incredible. <laughs> so I think I it's pretty that. neat. And these things migrate and they get built on and and added on to and stories exchange their DNA with other stories. So if you read the Penguin Book of Saints, um, you will find out that some of the saints never existed, but that mm -hmm. they got their DNA from other stories about saints. Uh, and one of my favorite and favorites in that respect was a town in Italy, because you had to have a relic, right? Uh, brought pilgrims, lucrative. So they had the head of John the Baptist. So not to be outdone, the next town over had the head of John the Baptist as a child. Wow. <laughs> These things build, you know, they accumulate. Yeah. Um, but, but we don't know because um, we don't know um, usually stories before the, there was, before they were written down, they were all oral. And right. somebody tells a story to somebody else and tells it to somebody else. And I'm sure you played broken telephone as a, as a child. Uh, so the stories change as they go through this process. And sooner or later, they turn into quite different stories. But the origin may have been story A. But, but folklorists trace this kind of thing. I love that type of thing with, with songs like um, there's one song that we recorded with Bonnie Light Horseman is, you know, uh, very common folk song, um, Green Rocky Road, you know, mm -hmm. and it's got that it's got that phrase, um, you know, uh, promenade in green, yeah. which I always thought was so beautiful, like the word promenade kind of sounds it's so bizarre in a folk song and and uh sounds like lemonade to me and i always liked it promenading green and i heard somewhere recently that it actually is um it used to be come you ladies green you know or come you oh. maids in green oh. and then it was misheard or was you know twisted around this way and it created this beautiful thing um, well that so makes many... sense yeah yeah but I love also the thing about the head of John the Baptist that it's almost like it doesn't matter if there's two heads of John the Baptist, you know, well, whoever two is better than one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. If one is good, two is better. <laughs> yeah. I should move us along here. Let me see what else I have on my list. Um, oh, yeah. Okay. This is at a selfish level. I want to hear about this, but I think a lot of people in, in our community will want to hear because this is a creative writing community. Um, I think a lot of people probably just stand in awe of the sheer prolificness of your writing over multiple decades and just curious. Um, I heard that you don't have a desk, um, which I think will, people will identify with that songwriters who are writing at the, you know, in the backstage rooms and in the hotel rooms. Yeah, and I stuff. don't have a, a ne I have a desk, but I don't have a necessary desk. Uh huh. I, I don't have one desk and I don't need a desk. I love this. And can you share with us just some of um, some of your writing process? Like, uh, do you write every day? Do you write when you don't no. feel like it? <laughs> OK, great. I'll take it well, from there. It depends what you're writing. So novels are work. Uh, one part inspiration, nine parts perspiration. You work at them. You get up in the morning. You sit down. You you work at it. And uh, Songs and, and poetry, I think, involve a different part of the brain. Um, you, you work at them once you have it. Once you have the thing, then you can uh, tinker with it, change it, rearrange it, etc. But, but just sitting there and assuming that today is a work day and you're going to sit down and a song will come to you uh, or a poem will come to you, that doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, you can then, if it's not happening, you can you can fool around with editing and different versions and renditions. But uh, I think those things uh, come out of a different, um, shall we say, mental process and uh, are much closer to the part of the brain that does patterning, rhythm, um, and dare I say, mathematics. Uh, so my process is uh, probably just as messy as everybody else's in, in that I, um, I have a lot of drafts often, but not always, because sometimes with uh, a thing such as a, I'm guessing, a song or a poem, it's pretty much there, and other times it's not. And when it's not, it goes into the drawer, 
I will take you to the drawer. It's right here. <laughs> Incredible. It's in this drawer. Stuff that looks like this. Like yeah. messy writing. Um, and then you never know when that thing in the drawer might come in handy. Mm -hmm. So you actually don't throw it out, but it's not done. So you put it in the not done drawer. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever, uh, so do you try to sort of bang out a draft? If you're feeling that flow, you sort of bang out a draft. You wouldn't sort of try to edit as you go. Not uh -huh. me. No, other people do. So yeah. everybody is different. Yeah. And, um, some people can't move on until they get that one line just the way they want it. And other people do a sketch. You know, you could say if it were a drawing, it would be a sketch. And then they work on that. And um, it, it takes as many drafts as it takes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know about drafts too. So do you have a conception or relationship with like a, the muse? Do you, the part of creativity that doesn't, that feels independent of your own efforts, you know, do you have any, um, after all these years, uh, sort of tips and tricks about courting that spirit and making okay. her stay? If it's not if it's not there for you and you're searching for that thing that you need, you've got a couple of things you can do. Number one, go to sleep. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, you may have it. Number two, go for a walk. So uh, disengage your conscious mind from the problem that you're working on and let the rest of your brain go to work on it. And, and the rest of your brain is actually pretty active. Um, and number three, do a repetitive physical thing like the ironing, uh, which has the same disengaging function. So those are my tips, and um, I'm sticking with them. It was so wise. I, I just had this flashback to um, working on Hadestown at one point in Brooklyn, and I, I was using a friend's studio um, and I would get on my bicycle and and ride around Prospect Park to get to his house, which is on the other side of the park. And when I'm when I was on the bike, I would have all these ideas, yeah, you know, yeah, I'd be yeah, so excited. Yeah. I get to the desk and then nothing would happen oh, for really? hours. Could yeah. you not remember those ideas? Um, well, the ideas were there. For me, it was a lyric. Mm. The lyric would oh, be yeah, there. And I'd okay. be like, that's the thing. And then I'd get to the desk and try to continue and I couldn't, um, there was some way in which I had access on the bike and I didn't have access at the desk. So I don't know. In that case, what you need is a stationary bike. So smart. So <laughs> smart. I'm writing down. <laughs> Amazing. I want to check on our time, uh, Margaret. I'm not seeing the mm -hmm. clock that I was told is on mm -hmm. the screen. So I don't okay, want to overdo it's, it. It's, we've got about four minutes. Okay, great. So maybe okay. time for one more question. Um, we can talk really fast. Blah, 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 blah. Or we can talk fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to combine two questions together here. Um, you probably realize that, you know, the folk music community right now, because of the pandemic, this is a community in crisis. Like um, uh, everyone in the music industry, but especially, you know, people who are working in the smaller sort of more grassroots circuit, um, everyone's in at least financial limbo, if not distress. And... Mm -hmm. And then together with that, a feeling of like identity crisis, because it's like, mm -hmm. who are we if we're not, if we're not performing? And, and a darker version of that thought, which is like, is this, is this work actually meaningful to the world at all? Or is this just me following my little dream? Because it feels in this historical moment, like we've been told the arts are not essential work, you know? Who told you that? Um, well, I'm picturing like, um, I'm picturing like, uh, the UK government, you know. Oh, well, you know, they're, they're so credible. Yeah. <laughs> Next. <laughs> okay. I'll make my little speech. The, the arts are the core of what it is to be a human being. They're absolutely essential to being human and music probably preceded speech. So, and, and certainly the the early uh, oral things that were going on around the campfire were, were musical, uh, possibly not only musical, but, but very, very musical. 
So the some cultures say the breath uh, is the spirit. And of course, singing is breath amongst uh, other things. I'll refer you to something you can see online, which is against the grain theaters messiah complex so instead of doing an in-person messiah which they could not do they did a cross canada messiah in six different languages including several um, native north american languages and in many different venues including the high arctic um, so one aria is sung in a sweat lodge another one is sung in a hockey rink um, have a look it's an inventive way of doing something on screen that you cannot do in person. So I wonder how that could be incorporated into the folk community, uh, working possibly with graphic artists and some of the uh, songs, uh, both archiving old, old pictures, but also creating new ones. Uh, or, for instance, doing uh, a person-to-person -person, um, sort of, um, what do you call those? When somebody writes a sentence, somebody writes the next sentence, somebody writes the next sentence. Mm -hmm. So somebody writes a first verse and then over to somebody else who adds a second verse and a third verse, because in the ballad tradition, and of course I was a big country and Western fan as a child because those songs had stories. So ballads tell stories. And it would be interesting to see how you could start a story with, with the first uh, verse and somebody else could change that story um, down the line as you're inventing it. So that might be an interesting thing to do um, live on air, as it were, just to see what people would come up with. Uh, so, so various kinds of different things that you can do online but especially for your community, this, this, is, a, this is a core activity. Uh, and it was once the way people got the news. So, so how are you going to tell the news of today in ballad form? That's what singer-songwriters do, among other things. It's not all um, brokenhearted love. Uh, in fact, a very small <laughs> amount of it is broken heart of love. A lot of it is train wrecks. <laughs> so speaking of train wrecks, you know, you've got a lot of material right now. <laughs> so, 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 so go for it and don't let anybody tell you that, that you're a frill because you're not a frill. You are the heart of the matter. And uh, when, when little, uh, you know, teenage boys uh, and girls are thinking about what they want to be when they grow up. It's 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 rarely an accountant. That's <laughs> not their dream. It's not their dream. Their dream is to be a, a singer. Come on. Right, right. Thank you so much for that message. That, and and also, and I feel like you're calling for sort of creative solutions and also, really like embracing the technology. Um, well, what choice do you have? Right. You know, are you going to sit there and be gloomy or are you going to go to town and, and uh, use what you've got? So when you've got lemons, make lemonade. And uh, this, this will rebuild itself. Um, it will all be back. And you want to be there when it is. So ready to go. As for the financial part, that's difficult. Um, but there are, you know, patrons and tip jars and those kinds of things. And I don't know what the grant situation is like in uh, your area. But Not as good but, as yours, maybe. I don't know. I don't know about mine because mm -hmm. I haven't asked any um, singer-songwriters how things are for, for them. Uh, but people are innovating, so, 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 so you can too. I love it. This was the pep talk we needed. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your time and your and your your mind. Um, and thank you. And I've really enjoyed everything I've seen of yours so far. And I'm going to get your new album. Likewise, I got your books like ready to go here. <laughs> um, thanks to Angus for setting this up. And we'll turn it back over to uh, Folk Alliance. Thank you, Aeneas, Margaret, and thank you all for attending today. 
We welcome you to share any final thoughts or comments you have in the chat. And this session will continue to be available as a recording on the Folk Unlocked platform all week. Finally, Folk Unlocked is made possible at a pay what you can price, thanks to the generosity of our community. If you would like to support our work, contributions can be made at folk.org slash donate. Stay safe and connected. Enjoy the rest of the conference and see you soon.